So the first question is going back to your earliest memory of using your imagination to create something. I mean, I think it has to be songwriting. You know, like my earliest memories, I think, of creating something from nothing were like imagining drums using like my tongue and my teeth. It's like a little five-year-old to try and create like a click track without really knowing what that was. Hmm. And imagining song structures as I'd only sort of heard from what my parents were listening to. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me unlocked a whole, I mean, obviously a whole lifetime of like creativity and so and songwriting, but that, mm -hmm. that first, like being five or six years old. And I remember looking in the mirror of my kindergarten or first grade, I, some like a little kid school and just like really imagining a song and like looking myself in the eye in the, in the mirror um, and being like, whoa, like what's happening in my brain? I can hear mm. like guitars and I can hear drums and feeling like mm. this is the, this is a drug for a five-year-old. This is so cool. Mm. <laughs> this feels yeah. crazy. Like it was very easy to hear those instruments mm -hmm. played out. Once it started. Yeah. Once it started, it was like, this is the best escape. It was, I would daydream all the time because mm. I was always just hearing songs. It's the way that I explain it um, to people is that like, if, if I'm, I can just, I can write, I'm always ready to write. I've, I've never had like, I've never really had writer's block. I've just been distracted. But if mm -hmm. I'm ever quiet enough, if I'm ever in the car and I turn off the radio, I just, I know a song will come because it's there. It doesn't mean it's a good song. It really doesn't. Oh, most mm -hmm. of the time it's not. But like, mm -hmm. it just means that it's always available. And I think mm -hmm. that that first, the first time that I realized that, that I could start hearing it was just bananas. And now I'm more used to it. And it's mm -hmm. something that I, I, I've harnessed as a songwriter and it's become sort of woven into my everyday. But mm -hmm. the first time when you're so little and you kind of think everyone else can hear it too. And then, mm -hmm. then you're like, no, 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 this is a private song for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What were your earliest instruments? I, <laughs> I played the flute in like fourth grade for a year. That was it. And then from that point, because I gave it up, my mom was like, okay, you're not that serious about music for a while. Like, we're not going to get you another instrument. My dad um, is an Episcopal priest. And so you know, that, which is a really honorable profession, but it's not a lucrative profession necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't like we can just go buy Grace a cello. And so when the flute didn't pan out, my mom was like, we're not, we're not going to do these wacky ideas anymore. And then mm -hmm. it was one night I went up to our attic because my, we had a, an old guitar, some that got passed down or something like that from years and years. I'd never seen anyone play it, but I went up late at night. I was maybe in like, like sixth or seventh grade. And I lied to my friends that I knew how to play the bass guitar. And now I had to like follow through on that lie. So I was like, shit, I have to teach myself the bass guitar tonight. And we don't have a bass guitar. And so I went up to the attic and I started restringing mm -hmm. this old guitar. And my mom came in and found me because she could hear these noises. And finally, I just remember her being like, okay, all right, you clearly like you want to play an instrument like, like it's time to do this. And so mm -hmm. um, I think I started with like bass guitar lessons and then that actually created a really good foundation of knowing like your root and your fifth and the third and like that really helped with understanding the foundation of music. And then I started mm -hmm. teaching myself guitar from there and like teaching myself piano, just any instruments that were like around at school or at home. I just like sort of was absorbing them again. I'm not mm -hmm. great at any instrument, but I mm -hmm. love all of them. Yeah. So from that early age, understanding that there are kind of tunes in your head that you can already hear, did you have an experience of trying to align playing an instrument to get those, to, to make it match that? I mean, I, yeah. I, I feel like that's, that is a way of learning instruments. It's just like, I'm just trying to make it match what I can hear and hear. And there is still a learning process, but it's not, as formal as like, mm -hmm. I'm learning my G chord. I'm learning to make that sound. And then I find out it's a G chord or whatever that is. Oh was, yeah. Was that's, there a matching? That's exactly what it was. That's, that's totally what it was. So I lied to say that I could play the bass guitar so that I could be in this band that was forming in school and they needed a bass guitarist. And so I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I play the bass. And then the rumor got like so heightened that like I was so good at the bass. 
I was like, but no one's even heard me play the bass and I don't know how to play this instrument. But the main reason why I was lying about this was because I so wanted to be included in this number of guys that were starting this band because I wanted, they were so much better at instruments than I was. And I really wanted to hear what I was hearing in my head from for them to play. Like I really wanted someone to do it and I didn't know how. And then mm -hmm. eventually I think by lying and then having to sort of teach myself the bass, it really was like, oh, now I can just like transcribe what's in my head on this instrument. It was mm -hmm. totally just a way of, of translating what was going on in, in my brain to mm -hmm. hear it. And I, you know, again, like, even if it was just a chord and I was hearing something more intricate in my brain, at least I had that like chord to like sing over, you know, mm -hmm. and layering different things like, like experimenting with, um, yeah, with garage band. And so I would play the one chord and I didn't really know how to play in time or anything like that. But then I knew that that sounded right. And I, and I could kind of figure out, you know, fret by fret, the other parts that I was hearing and seeing mm -hmm. it all come together was, a, a, again like a drug like if the first time was like when I'm five and I can hear it and I'm and I'm mm -hmm. tapping in then discovering that I could like I could hear it again and I could really like actually put it into a computer and mm -hmm. a device and I could hear it whenever I wanted I would stay up late listening to my own like shitty demos being like this mm -hmm. is amazing mm -hmm. yeah to be so in tune with like oh this is worth getting out at a young age like mm -hmm. it's such an interesting journey to to know where you want to get to and to just be like, I got to figure out ways of chipping away at that. Yeah. Um, you just have to just take the first step. It's almost like ripping off a bandaid. I think of like, it's not going to sound exactly like what you imagine in your brain, mm -hmm. but it's going to feel so good to get it out there. And I think especially like for me, the, some of my earliest songwriting was really honest and I actually really liked that about my songwriting. I kind of actually stopped being so honest for a while because I was struggling with my sexuality. And so I, like the first songs I was writing were so raw that I, I couldn't help myself almost. It had to be mm -hmm. this honest. And then once I started sharing my songs more and more, or I felt more comfortable to share my songs, then I was like, oh, I should probably protect myself a little bit because I'm not ready to be this honest. But there is, yeah, there's totally this catharsis of just getting it out there, even if it's not, even if you know it's not perfect, at least like mm -hmm. the expression now exists where mm -hmm. there was just nothing before. There was just mm -hmm. something in my brain that no one could hear, unfortunately. Yeah. It would have been a lot easier. I'm so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> this is so beautiful. Whatever you just thought was awesome. That, that's part of why I think getting better at piano was something I've really worked towards the past few years because it, you can, I can really play something for someone that even if it's not precise, they can get a notion and we can start talking about the concept. Whereas before I'd just be like, hu -hu, like making these like hums and they're like, I, I can't totally help you with whatever <laughs> yeah. you're doing. Yeah. So staying younger a little bit, did anybody in your life model the confidence to put out something that's not fully formed? Did you see that resonated in anybody else around you? Or was that something that you feel like was unique to you? I'm, I certainly, I don't think it was unique to me, but I think that it was around the era of like MySpace and Pure Volume and you were just seeing more artists start using the internet to share their music, All, like knowing that it wasn't done done, but knowing that in order to get to that level, to sort of like ascend to a level where you can work with like a, a label if you want, but you're, you're working in a studio, like all that sort of, all those resources are only going to come for you if you have already invested in putting yourself out there. So mm -hmm. I think that I was seeing that being modeled on the internet. And there were, there were like a few kids at my school that were doing it, but it wasn't really like the cool thing when I went the high school, um, where I was sports were definitely like the cool thing to do. And I also mm -hmm. did sports as well, which made me actually a bit shy about revealing too much about my music because mm -hmm. it was very like a high school musical Zac Efron type of thing. Like I remember revealing to my team that I was 
wanting to sing and like write music. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was so nervous to like mm -hmm. talk to them about that. Mm -hmm. So I think mostly it was just like private internet searches and seeing bands and artists start to sort of like blow up and create these followings online um, mm -hmm. that opened me up to the possibility of like, you know, if you just start sharing things, you know, if people, you, your people will find you. It doesn't mean your music's for everybody, mm -hmm. but your people can't find you if they don't know that you're out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What was your first experience of seeing maybe somebody else do that and be like, oh, that's so specific. And I, re I, I relate to that so specifically that it feels almost like they were like, hey, Grace, like, we know this is going to be for you. And you're just like, whoa, it's fun to connect to the thing that the masses connect with, but it's also fun to connect with something that's like, this yeah. feels so personal. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like I could give a different answer on a different day, sort of like, but the, the band that's coming to me right now is Tegan and Sarah, because I remember hearing about them was word of mouth. They, I didn't learn about them on the radio or like seeing them on like top 40 or on MTV mm -hmm. or something. I heard about them through a friend and just, and the friend was like sharing their music and like sharing their story. And I can't remember if I was out to this person at the time, but I just remember when she was like, yeah, they're both gay. And I was like, they're gay and they're writing about like, about being gay like you can do that mm -hmm. um and i remember like listening to some of their songs that just felt really specific and it really did feel like sort of stumbling upon like a secret band that was so cool and yeah i i remember like pouring over whatever videos they had on on youtube at the time and watching like any interviews that i could find with them because i just thought it was they seemed so comfortable with themselves and when you're mm -hmm. younger that is like that seems impossible like mm -hmm. having like a general like sense of confidence and peace mm -hmm. in an interview where you can just be uh composed and you're not mm -hmm. always wondering about what other people thought of you i just so admired that from them and mm -hmm. I remember being like, wow, this is my favorite little secret band and no mm -hmm. one will ever like they're writing these songs specifically for me. And that's so mm -hmm. nice of them. <laughs> and they clearly nice. super nice. And they planted my friend to tell me about them. It's all mm -hmm. a big scheme. It's actually all yeah. about me. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm so thankful for them. Yeah. Okay. So you're, I've in other interviews heard you grew up overseas. Yeah. Your father's a priest. Priest. Yeah. He's a priesty priest. Well, did you grow up with two parents? I did grow up with two parents. My parents are married. They, My dad proposed to my mom three months after meeting her. Wow. They've been together. I know. Isn't that crazy? And um, crazier that she said yes. on like I'm like, mom, that's so bananas. If I had a friend that was like, this guy three months later, we're engaged. I'd be like, well, let's ask some questions. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, all my friends just trusted me. I was like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Um, anyway, yeah, they're they're still together. I love my parents. I think they're their support at home was really rare i've actually come to learn and even mm -hmm. though there were still a lot of things that they couldn't protect me from having the foundation of their support and love i think has just allowed me to like re-examine old wounds because i i have like i have that foundation and i have mm -hmm. that support and so even though some things are really painful, at least that isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having a home base totally. to come back to from which to kind of gather yourself after going out and maybe bumping into something really challenging to come mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Gather yourself again and then go out again. That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge part of, of growing up. How much do you think your early conceptions of what the world was like how people acted was informed by doing it in a, in a, in a specific different country. Like how much do you feel? Cause what, what country specifically was it? It was in Belgium. I grew up in Waterloo, Belgium. Belgium. Yeah. How much as you left and maybe reflecting back, what percentage did Belgium like provide this framework from which then like other things were? I mean, honestly, I think it's gotta be like 80 or 90% because mm -hmm. 
where my childhood, where I grew up, that friend group, that that like hometown that none of my friends still live in anymore because it's an international community. So everyone is like um, mm -hmm. transient, like people come in, they leave, like people, you'd have a best friend for three years, their parents, a diplomat, they leave to another mm -hmm. country that you'll never travel to in your life. You keep mm -hmm. in touch, you like root for each other because you went through this crazy experience of growing up at a really small international school in a small Western European country. And you're mm -hmm. the only people that understand what that's like. It's really mm -hmm. hard to explain. It was such an amazing place to grow up. Mm -hmm. I'm still best friends, like family levels of best friends. We, I mean, very much people will, I'm, I'm auntie like to their kids, like very mm -hmm. much like close knit and we'll never live in the same country, you know, cause we're all so spread out and it really formed how I, I think just like I mean, entirely how I approach the world because I grew up feeling feeling okay with discomfort because so at one point in time there were 50 different nationalities in our graduating class of 63 people I think that was like an eighth grade we did like a tally ninth grade and you and your class kind of pretty much stays the same like people move in and out but you're you're pretty much it's around a, a robust number of nationalities are represented mm -hmm. so there's no predominant culture you know and so yeah. no one's cool <laughs> like yeah. I mean there were like cool kids but they're and obviously we did go through the UGG phase, like every school had to, everyone had UGGs at some point in time, but like mm -hmm. aside from like, like weird quirky things like that, it wasn't mm -hmm. that like the Americans are cool and like the Belgians are this or the Swedes are this or whatever. It was this huge mix of kids just figuring out who they are, like your most volatile years, your teenage mm -hmm. years in this ecosystem of of cultures and and nationalities and i think mm -hmm. that growing up feeling okay with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and just feeling like you don't need to have all the answers and someone can be culturally different from you and that's amazing and it's not like remote like that threat was never like presented yeah totally informed how i see the world and i think mm -hmm. also i mean you have it led to a lot of culture shock. I I thought that because I was considered in my class like a more American of the kids because both my parents are American. So I was like, yeah, Grace is American. I was like telling all my friends, I was like, yeah, like when I go to the US for university, like that's when that's when I'll fit in. Like that's, I'm really gonna hit my stride then. And I mm -hmm. was like violently depressed when I moved to the US. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that this was like my people and like this is where I'm gonna fit in. But the reason why I felt weird was normal teenage reasons. And then coming to the US for university, I had a really bad culture shock and I've mm -hmm. adjusted and whatever now, of course, but that's, I think, part of why I like really cling to those friendships and those relationships. And I'm always going to be pulling inspiration from my time growing up in Belgium because it's transformative and there's nothing mm -hmm. like it. Like I, if I meet another international kid, I can connect with them in 30 seconds than someone who lives in my same neighborhood right now. Mm -hmm. Like I get it. I really get it. So it totally mm -hmm. made it totally. It's how I it's totally how I operate. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know any other way of being. Thank God yeah. for Belgium. I love Belgium. <laughs> the international school that you went to was it pluralistic in terms of how it held everybody? Was it trying to honor everybody that was there? Uh, you're there mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. some things that are fairly objective, but did the actual bigger institution have a religious structure, or is that was it outside of that? And what was your experience of? holding multiple realities, holding multiple opinions, life experiences, mm -hmm. traditions. How did your faith at that time reflect that community? Mm -hmm. It's definitely, it was definitely a strange balance. So it was a Catholic school that was founded by nuns. And as the school grew, as, you know, Belgium has become like more of a, a, a center with like the EU being based in Brussels and things like that, you just have more and more um, nationalities and cultures and of course um, communities of faith represented and thereby coming into St. John's, which is the school I went to. So it was founded by nuns, but they, and we had mass on Wednesdays, but we also had a religion course and we had um, 
different like curriculums on different religions and faiths. And they did, I think they did their very best to be accommodating to a lot of different traditions. Like we had a, a Santa Lucia celebration, which is Scandinavian. And I know that's still based in like Christian traditions, but it's still something that if I were to say like, oh, we, we celebrated Santa Lucia in the US, they'd be like, who, is, who, like, who is that? And mm -hmm. um, we had like a festival of lights and they, I think they really, as a school, I think they really did their best to honor different traditions. And anytime there was like a religious community that was celebrating, we would always talk about it. It's hard for me to like say how well they did because I'm still, mm -hmm. I was still raised in a Christian tradition. So I'm sure someone who, cause I remember like celebrating Yom Kippur or something and like talking about that. And I'm learning about it for the first time, like nine or 10 years old. So I imagine that like another student who like grew up celebrating Yom Kippur would have a different assessment of how that was taught than like me learning it, being like, wow, they're nailing it. Um, they're nailing so, Yom Kippur. They're doing yeah. great. These nuns are crushing it. But I know that like an effort was definitely made. Mm -hmm. How good it was, I don't really think that's for me to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that like the interesting thing that I, I remember clocking, and perhaps it's because that's when I started recognizing that who I am was starting to conflict with Christianity that was introduced to me when American missionaries started like coming over to St. John's and like holding like youth breakfasts and like young life started becoming involved. Um, but basically they were not students. They were not parents. They were not affiliated with the school at all. And people would just like come through and be like youth people um, from the US, <laughs> like youth people. Yeah, well, I think that they, I, I think that they had to like talk to them that they couldn't come to campus anymore mm. because it was weird, you know? I don't know, it's complicated because I also had a youth leader that was amazing. Like I had a youth leader that was great, but there were so many youth programs that were popping up and not all of them were good. And that's where, not all of them were good, but they all kind of supported each other because I don't think that anyone was really asking questions about like what the other's doing. It was like a, almost like a trust system of like, well, I trust mm -hmm. that I'm good. So I'm sure they're good too. And yeah, mm -hmm. if, if you can't come to my retreat, like go to this retreat or whatever. And mm -hmm. not all youth leaders were created equal, I learned. And, um, <laughs> and I think that that was when when evangelism came to our international school was like a turning point for me where I was like, this is very different than the conversations we're having in religion class. Like this is a different approach. This is evangelism is a totally different thing. Okay. So very curious because you are in a Christian institution, you're in a, you're from a Christian family and then you're experiencing being evangelized too. Yeah. And I only in recent years have been on the receiving end of something like that. Oh, you have received like, how people have been evangelizing to you. Yeah. I think in, in various ways, I mean, I live in the city and so people don't know you from Adam. And so they start hot or they start <laughs> with the questions where I know these questions. Yeah. I went to Bible school. I know, I know exactly what's going on. And so I know this is not a personal conversation, even no, no, though no. in their mind, they think it's the most personal conversation. It's, a, it's actually the least personal. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. And yet it was an assignment when I was mm -hmm. in school mm -hmm. to go do this. So you just living your young grace life, being like, I'm living this great yeah. multicultural existence. Yeah. And there's these other people that are also saying that they're affiliated with something that I'm not necessarily disagreeing with mm -hmm. as far as like the label. Mm -hmm. What was your, your personal experience of how those messages felt to receive being where you were from and yeah. what you knew to be true for yourself? It's so confusing. It's so confusing because I really felt like I understood Christianity. I feel like I had a pretty 
solid understanding of what it meant from the inside, basically, like through my dad growing up in church. I'm not saying that my dad ran a perfect church and like he and I have talked about things that are difficult with running a church and questions that I, I wished that he'd asked. And while he was affirming, he was never explicitly affirming. And I think I would that would have been great. And you kind of don't know what you don't know at the time. He didn't know his kid was gay. But anyway, I, I felt like I had a really solid understanding. Like my dad was a good guy. My friends all loved my dad. He was just really accepting, really chill. Like his perspective was solid. Like I remember one time uh, he just said, you know, I was stressed about like going to church or something. And he was like, we just sort of reached this point as a family where he's like, if you don't want to go to church, like you don't have to go. Like you don't have to go. It's not, that's not, God doesn't need you. He's not taking attendance but God is available to you. And I want you to know that God loves you and you don't have to dress a certain way. Like I could go in my basketball shorts. Of course there were like certain services like Christmas where it'd be, my mom would be the one that would say like, it would be really nice for your father to support him. To, this is a big service. He's been working on a sermon, like things like that. And you show up for your parents and this is my dad's job. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I really had this understanding that was very like peaceful, even if I wasn't totally checked in because I'm a teenager doing teenage stuff. I've gotten mm -hmm. busy. And then these like missionaries started coming over and their messaging was like really different. And it was not chill. <laughs> it was like not cool. It was, <laughs> And they would like check up on you if you didn't make it to a, a breakfast. They had these like youth breakfasts and stuff before school. <laughs> You're starting your day with shame. Like just kick off your day as a 17 year old by feeling like shit. And then just, you know, and then just let that sit with you for the rest of the day. You're not uh, insecure enough at 17 years old and your Ugg boots. Like we want to really twist that. And that was so confusing. I would see that they were like cool with my dad. They'd like, you know, when, when the parents would come around and like the, the youth leaders would be around, they'd all be kind of like, I don't know, like dabbing each other up of whatever parents do, like just like shaking hands. And they're all, they all think that they're like on the same team. I think a lot of those Christian leaders, and I think this is true, not just in a, a really small sort of circle, like an international community in Belgium. I think wherever you go, faith communities when they start sort of congregating with each other you all like assume you're cool and like you're all on the same page and so i would mm -hmm. see this and it would be so confusing because i'm like my dad has never evangelized to me before and i'm not hearing about the i'm not hearing about like hell and behaviors and my dad has never talk to me about like what my friends are wearing um specifically girls because you know like purity culture and modesty is heavily skewed towards young girls mm -hmm. and um so it was just so it was so so confusing and really difficult to reconcile and then also the to the credit of like the young lifey people they really honed in on like the cool kids at school like the the kids that were just popular and so then it became like a social thing too. Like you, like, oh, you see these kids that are like literally getting voted prom queen going to the youth breakfast. Like, well, maybe, you know, I don't know if I want to be prom queen, but I don't want to not like, I, <laughs> like I want to be in with whatever they're talking about. And then you sit there mm -hmm. and you're like, they're talking about some like <laughs> intense things. But now I've, I've like took a step too far because if I stop going, they'll ask me about it. Hmm. So I was in Young Life in high school. Oh. And so I get exact, but in the States, in central Illinois, mm -hmm. and I get that. It's like, oh, whoa, like you latch onto the coolest. And this was never in my understanding mm -hmm. on paper, but it was the cool youth group. It mm -hmm. was like the social club. Yeah. And at camp, there was a smoker's pit. And so you could also smoke. Oh, that's how they get you. But then there's a 15 person hot tub and it's a super horny experience, <laughs> but like, don't, we got to go to chapel. But don't, but don't address it. No one talk don't about address it. it. And if you do talk about it, we're going to, you know, have a leaders meeting about you having like a normal teenage experience mm -hmm. or thought in a hot tub with your peers. Like mm -hmm. 
I, well, it's such I, young life. Oh my gosh. There's a, you know, there's a, a hashtag going around called do better young life of people just sharing their oh. stories about like abuse and from the macro to the micro mm -hmm. um, under young life leadership. And mm -hmm. I don't know if they've responded to it, but I, I saw it sort of gain a lot of traction going mm -hmm. back. And I think that's really good that people are now sort of able to step into their power and share their stories and that there's a hashtag to collect these stories. Cause I think that through social media, people that were told that you're the problem, you're alone, no one else is like you, you're isolated are now mm -hmm. able to like find each other and be like, Oh, I was not alone. I'm not, I wasn't crazy. Y'all just mm -hmm. gaslit me into thinking that I was doing something wildly inappropriate or thinking something wildly inappropriate that is actually totally normal and mm -hmm. I don't need to carry this shame that you put on me. It never belonged yeah. to me. This is your deal. Yeah. Yeah, let's stick with that of normal growing up, normal development of a human being. Obviously, it's widely different for every single person, but there are just general like, this is when you come into the understanding of this. Mm -hmm. This is when you start feeling this, like, or it's likely that you will be feeling more of these things. And having space to hold the very natural, very understandable levels that you're talking about. Like mm -hmm. Wanting to fit in, adjusting how you look to like match something that you feel is cool. Like all this stuff mm -hmm. only much later in my experience realize, like you're saying, is very normal. But within the narrow confines of a Christian experience come to find that so much later or like it's you are you're you're set up as an exception to mm -hmm. what is normal you yeah. need to be an exception that's the most important thing like that almost like going through puberty is a non-christian experience yeah it's like and that's so it's when like, the temptation sets yeah. in from the outside world and it's like is that is that what that is it's not temptation right. it's growth it's literally you're growing up it's and then literally they hormones. You, it's hor it's literally new hormones entering your body. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they tell you that the natural sort of effect of these hormones and of also just, you know, maturing with age and your interests and kind of figuring out like who you are, like testing different things out, that that is unhealthy. And in so doing, I think you really stunt the natural... I guess, path of a lot of kids. It's why there's this term in the queer community that's called like second puberty. And it, mm. I a thousand percent, like it hit for me, which is um, that you don't go through, if you're queer, you most of the time, although there are exceptions, don't go through puberty as yourself. Like I went through puberty again, like Ugg boots, skinny jeans, high femme. I mean, not high femme. I don't think anyone would say it was high femme, but like very feminine, long hair, like makeup, really trying to fit in. I put on like nails for prom, all this stuff. And that was fully method acting was in like, I knew the whole time just was fraudulent. <laughs> like I'm happy mm -hmm. that some people were convinced, but that person never existed. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not happy that some people were convinced, but at the time that was like my coping mechanism. So I was very happy that people were buying it, even though like I knew that this was totally a lie. Mm -hmm. So then when you become more comfortable with yourself and you get older, you go through like second puberty where you get to actually like kind of express yourself how you would have wanted to when you were a teenager. And that definitely happened to me around like 25 or 26 when I started being honest with myself and with other people. I was like, okay, I want to like shave the back of my head. I want mm -hmm. every tattoo and I need them now. And I need, <laughs> I need like all, all the sort of like angst that I really mm -hmm. was never able to express in a healthy mm -hmm. way as an actual teenager, it just sort of was like put on pause until I felt safe enough to do so in my twenties. And mm -hmm. I'm fortunate that like, I have a very patient wife and friend group <laughs> to like be with me through, through the um, growing pains. But I think that's sort of something I would want to talk about with Christian youth leaders that try and keep kids in these very like puritanical white Western boxes, like mm -hmm. you can't contain who someone is. Like mm -hmm. that's the beauty of how different we all are. 
-hmm. they're gonna, it's gonna find a way. And whether mm -hmm. you, maybe you'll stunt them through their first puberty, but then you'll just get me at 30, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like trying to like skateboard, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like I'm going to do it. It's going to happen because we are, mm -hmm. humans are so resilient and we are really mm -hmm. just, I think there's this sort of the sense of divine in all of us that will find a way just, you should have been there to foster it the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that, in that time when you've got, you know, you've got what home is, and then you've got kind of a big understanding of what isn't home. Like these people <laughs> from another place trying to convince you that your home yeah. is, is a bad home or yeah. isn't quite the right home or all that mm -hmm. like, weird, like not just getting to be 15, 16, like we're talking about, not getting to just develop as a, as a human being. What avenues, expressions of either activity or creative things were grounding to you, helped you f come back to like, oh, this is like who Grace is. This is what Grace mm -hmm. wants to do. Like these things where it's like, okay, like at least this is here close to my heart, mm -hmm. close to my chest. Like this feels grounding and like reassuring. Songwriting. Like that, mm -hmm. that to me is such a blessing in my life. And again, not to say that every song is like this amazing song, but the fact that I could process things privately, but honestly to myself through songwriting was game changing. I couldn't talk about certain things. I wasn't ready to, but there's this strange property of a song that it just sort of flows out there's no editing. So I, you know, if I would do like a journal entry, sometimes I would try and keep a diary. I would still find myself editing myself, not being totally honest, which is a strange thing in a diary. Cause it already, then you're like, well, what this defeats the purpose. Why am I writing this down? Cause I know this isn't how I really feel, but I can't seem to express it with songwriting. Even though down the line, when I would record it, I might edit myself you know, change a pronoun so that people wouldn't know it was about a girl or something like that. But in the moment of writing it, I, I was really honest. And I think that really helped remind me of who I am, of what I value. And letting it out helped me know that it would be okay. Hmm. I don't know why. I really don't know why, <laughs> because sometimes it would be really sad. <laughs> but for some reason, letting it out I maybe it just like took away the power of certain feelings of being inadequate or being like unlovable. You know, mm -hmm. once you release it from my heart and from my brain onto like an instrument, onto like a recording in GarageBand that no one will hear, it just like takes the power of the feeling away or at least like diminishes it for a little bit, which makes things okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that level of like giving oxygen to something so that it fills a bigger space and thus mm -hmm. isn't so concentrated and and like piercing. I think that yeah, that's no, that's, so that's interesting. totally it. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned writing because I've written for many, 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 many years. It's like it's like one of the things you're supposed to do as like a young yeah. person, and then like a young Christian person. It's like, hey, journal. Yeah, there's always <laughs> this idea, and I don't know. I think it's just the nature of how I learned about what is mine, um, which is very little, like very little is private. Thus, like writing, there was always an audience. There's at least mm. God there that's kind mm -hmm. of looking over my shoulder. And because my view of God mm -hmm. was so synonymous with the harsh critic, mm -hmm. then like, yeah, I was like writing just in case somebody found this journal. Yeah. And so yeah, like that. That's totally, yeah, I totally get that. It's not a, it's not a freeing feeling. It's like, it's a discipline then you're doing it because it's the good thing to do, or mm -hmm. it's the thing that, you know, if anybody asks you like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing, doing the right things here, but it's mm -hmm. there, there, it lacks catharsis in so many ways for me until I found a creative avenue just recently in drawing and I was just like, oh my gosh, like I'm saying everything I wanted to say in drawing that I wanted mm. that I couldn't even use words to say what I like. That's the most explicit thing you can 
-hmm. it's very clear that that word means that. But yeah. like finally drawing a, 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 a line said the thing that I was actually feeling. And that was for me. So I'm interested in maybe some other things that you tried where it also, it maybe felt similarly in terms of this isn't totally for me. So I keep coming back to songwriting. Were there mm. other things that you dabbled in where it was like, you know what, this doesn't feel like it's as for me as writing a song is for me. Yeah. I think I tried stand up comedy and I did stand up for, I mean, it was the reason why I moved to LA. I was like convinced that I was going to be a stand up comedian. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because mercifully many people who go through things that are traumatic or painful develop a sense of humor, which I think is kind of a beautiful consequence to having to go through hard things. Mm -hmm. And that was true in my case. And I started just sort of like telling jokes and stories about my life and things that I was going through. And then I, you know, started going to open mics and I was like, I could really do this. And, and the stakes were never that high, you know, like I never, I was like, yeah, I could do that. Like, why not? I was never that scared of stand up. Of course I get nervous before I would go on stage, but like I would figure out my sets, you know, on, on the way to the mic moved out to LA and it just felt very safe. Hmm. And, um, I never, I, it just, I, I met some people that were on fire for stand up. I had a roommate for a time who's like just so passionate about comedy and just fills up journals with jokes and just always is plugging away at the craft. He'd be out at mics until like three or 4 AM. Mm -hmm. You know, he just pours everything into his work. And I never felt like doing that. You know, I, I was like, I'll do the bare minimum and I, and I could get decent laughs and I could get like booked on shows, but it just never really like scared me or made me feel vulnerable. And the other thing about it too, was I started realizing as I got more comfortable with myself, as I was approaching second puberty, basically that I was just making jokes to deflect from dealing with things I needed to deal with. And so I was just, I was always making like gay jokes. I was making like trans jokes about gender. Like it was all the stuff that I was joking about were the things that I needed to work through. And I think once I started getting more comfortable with myself, when I really sort of felt like I'd landed in LA, I got more curious about the root of what I was joking about. And I realized like, didn't, I didn't feel good about it. And other people are making incredible gay jokes and like jokes about gender. Like I totally think you can make these jokes and you can joke about almost anything, but I wasn't feeling good about it. And I wasn't coming from a good place. It was, you know, the, the expression is like, you always want to punch up. You don't want to punch down. And I was like, just kicking the shit out of myself on stage. Yeah. Like I was just like really making myself the butt of jokes and people mm -hmm. that, and communities that I care about and now belong to was all, we're also becoming like the butt of jokes. And I was like, that's, that's not who I want to be. That's not where I feel passionate at all. And so I just kind of quietly stopped doing stand up. And then when I stopped doing stand up, it was like tapping into the radio of my songwriting again, because I just sort of put it off. I was like, I don't want to write about anything I'm going through right now. And then once I took away the distraction of like, making jokes about myself, the radio just like clicked back on. And it was just I, honestly, ever since it's just been like a, 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 a water fountain of just like, I can just kind of turn it on and off. And I'm grateful for my time in stand up. And I had some really fun times and I've gotten to see some incredible shows. I got to travel for the first time through stand up, and I love performing. That hasn't changed. Like I love being on stage. If you come to a similar show where I'm performing music, of course, we're going to like laugh. It's going to be fun. I'm really comfortable there, but I am happy that I'm not my own punching bag anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you mentioned about it wasn't scary. Mm -hmm. It's such a personal, every person's going to have that thing that is like, eh, it's not. It's fine. It's, it's not that it's too easy. But mm -hmm. there, the risk is low. Yes. I'm yeah. Because stand up is much. hard. Yeah. Stand up it's is hard. Very hard. And, and like and I've just... bombed before. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. 
but it was never like it just never felt just like you said it's the it was the risk factor it was like all right i bombed and that sucks but i'm not gonna think about it again and i'm not gonna you know i i might just cut a joke from my set but i'm not gonna really dwell on how i could get better i'm mm -hmm. kind of find a wallow <laughs> like i'm kind of find mm -hmm. to just be like a a middle of the road type of gay comic and now i think with with songwriting i'm like so motivated and like determined in a new way of like I want to get so good at this like I want mm -hmm. to be undeniable and I never really felt that with com with comedy mm -hmm. yeah so let's let's dive into that a little bit of because like you're saying with some some people in stand-up like like that, that's a that's a that's something you need in stand-up is to be able to say I'll be fine even though I bombed but as far as that risk reward that that amount of being seen exactly how you would prefer to be seen. Mm -hmm. I have such an interesting balance, especially with songwriting. It's like, and I think it's just a, a development thing in general. It's like sharing something that is not yet processed or not processed enough. Therefore it's very raw. It's very, it's, it's an open wound. It's not a wound, not that wounds need to be fully understood to share. It's a wavelength that every person has to tune in for themselves. Of like, mm. this has the right amount of vulnerability, and this is not too terrifying. Specifically with songwriting, what has been that kind of like those up, up and down those wavelengths of like, oh, this is when I went too far this way and too far this way. I'm not asking for a specific mm -hmm. if there's, you know terrible experiences or anything like that, but just times when you're like, okay, I pinged this far. Uh, I want to kind of steer it back this way and what things you adjusted in order to get back to a place that feels like that really exciting. It's, mm -hmm. it's scary, but it's not crippling. It's thrilling, but it's not too easy. I think recently I've, especially with Preacher's Kid, it feels like a project that I, I could have made, or it feels like the most, the closest to those early days of like high school songwriting for me. Songs that I was like making on GarageBand with my laptop as like the only mic that I was sharing very privately, almost to no one, but sometimes to, I, sometimes I'd throw them out on MySpace or something, but like that, that raw sort of earnest, like, let's just go for it type thing that I feel like I've only just now on this most recent project. And I think part of that is through quarantine and just the only resources I have are like this mic and my instruments. And that is limiting, but it also is really freeing as a songwriter because it's like, I only have myself and rather than let that scare me, like, endless possibilities. I'm going to go to work for myself. Let's see what we make. Like, let's see what's kicking around in there. There's no producer, engineer, or another bandmate who can have a say in this. It's just up to me. And that's been really exciting about this project. And I think that prior to Preacher's Kid, I just was really overthinking all of my songs and how I was writing. I was really overthinking things that I could have said better. I could have just that maybe needed less editing actually. And I think I was taking it all a bit too seriously because since I've just sort of almost like, you know, in sports, they like shake it off. I feel like mm -hmm. ever like what I've done in quarantine is I've just like shaken off any pretense. What do I want to say? Like, what do I want to say? What am I writing about here? What am mm -hmm. I processing right now? And I think before I was so focused on like, okay, if I'm going to put out a single, it has to be a hit. It has to be good. It has to be, you know, playlisted on Spotify. So what does that sound like? How can I emulate that sound? Mm -hmm. What are the images that people are using? How can I bring that into my songwriting? And I was really concerned about what was doing well for other people rather than just mm -hmm. what do I want to say? Mm -hmm. And being alone and just really not even being able to go into a studio and not being able to bounce around ideas, even though I love collaborating and I hope in the future to do so. But I think stripping all that back for a minute, it really allowed me to tap into the kid who was, you know, writing music 
for no one in high school. And mm -hmm. I think that like, that's an important part of me that I, I want to bring into all my projects from now on, because I think mm -hmm. that that's an honesty and a vulnerability that I I'm sad. I kind of lost track of, cause I was so, mm -hmm. you know, you get so worried about like, what's going to work because you, mm -hmm. as an artist, as a creative, you have to think about that too. You have mm -hmm. to think about like, are people going to listen to this? You mm -hmm. know, is this going to help me achieve my goals? I'd be lying if you say that that's not a consideration, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be the main consideration. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what I lost sight of. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's interesting. You kind of reference that, that younger self of that stripped down, like th these conditions in the last year mm -hmm. plus mimicked that or not actually mimicking i guess it's like <laughs> yeah has forced that forced that back and i i don't i think that that is like a choosing to go back to that stopping point interestingly and say like oh like there was something yet finished or something that i wish i could have expressed more fully or mm -hmm. done at that moment to go back and honor that stopping point that maybe there was disappointment there or there mm -hmm. was sadness around the conditions that maybe made that the only option at that point or didn't see a way through whatever that, that, that block was. I think that that's a really beautiful thing to kind of meet yourself. Yeah. Hover many years back and be like, all right, like I'm back and I've got like all these years mm -hmm. of experience. Like, let's do this like together. I think yeah, meeting that younger <laughs> self is really beautiful. It's kind of like I can play guitar better now. So like what, whatever you were <laughs> working on, let's kind of re revisit that stuff. Yeah. And I think just there's those first songs that I was writing were so specific. Like I was throwing out like names of people and stuff. And I don't think I've named anyone on Preacher's Kid, but I like really love that specificity in my writing. And it's something that I, I think I had sort of lost because I was trying to write for broader, for a broader audience. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. people to find my music and to relate to it. And what I found when I put out Jesus from Texas on SoundCloud, just initially, just to kind of get it out there, I didn't know it was going to be like on an EP or anything was that the most specific verse, the one where I'm, I'm not saying the person's name, but if you know me, you know exactly who I'm talking about, um, was the song that people seem to relate to. And I was like, mm -hmm. and and it was a good reminder to me of like, yeah, because that's, that's good songwriting for you. Mm -hmm. That's how you started. This was mm -hmm. always sort of your way of journaling. So why did you mm -hmm. stop doing it that way? Mm -hmm. You know, you should get back into doing that. And again, I can play guitar better now. So like we, <laughs> we can make this sound even better. Mm -hmm. How do you join up with the younger self and not shame the younger self for stopping? It's hard. I think it's a process. That's such, that's such a good thing to think about. I think it does take time, unfortunately, which especially if you are the younger self listening, that probably sucks to hear, but I think it takes time and practice you know, I, for a while, I couldn't look at younger photos of myself. I was mm -hmm. so ashamed of that person. Mm -hmm. They felt like such a coward to me. I couldn't look at them. I was like, oh, like this person sucks. And I would see friends of mine who were always presenting as themselves that seemingly, you know, because grass is always greener. I'd like look at photos of them in high school being out and gay and like living their full fantasy. And I'd be like, why couldn't I have just been like this person? Like, why didn't I do that? And of course they had their own struggles as well. Like no one, everyone goes through this coming of age experience. You don't, you don't get spared from it. Mm -hmm. But I think through time and just recognizing that if it wasn't for that kid taking the first step, just absolutely in the dark, I wouldn't be here, you know? Mm -hmm. And that they were doing everything that they could to cope. And it's it's like a, it's an exercise in patience. And mm -hmm. it's something I'm still working towards. And very much my music is a way of expressing, I think, gratitude. Writing about things that I would have been so embarrassed about at the time. or Or even like four years ago, I would have like 
felt ashamed of writing about them. And I'm thinking specifically of like the song Chicken on the EP where I'm talking about like kind of navigating a secret queer relationship and mm -hmm. that, you know, that's okay. And like you did everything that you had to do and I like, don't want to, if I hate that person, I'm hating myself and I'm not going to be doing that anymore. So mm -hmm. I have to like make peace with them. And I, and, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, I developed a pretty good sense of humor about it. Like there were some, there were some moments that like I served, it looks like I'm in drag, but like, that was a good look. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I had to do it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you do what you have to do and good for me. And again, it's, mm -hmm. I, I'll let you know. I'll get back to you if I ever figure it out. But I'm working <laughs> on it every day, and I really, I really care about that kid. And she was a, mm -hmm. she was a good little egg. She's just yeah. trying her best. Yeah, it does seem to be a theme in in this album is honoring the kids mm -hmm. and honoring how old they are, and mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to be any older than they are. They shouldn't have to know more about the world than they know at this moment. Like it's mm -hmm. about exploration. It's about coming into awareness. And I think it's so interesting to do that within the Christian context, because for as much love is preached, there's, I think, implicit so much self-hatred. You know, like, I don't necessarily think that there is, in my, I'll just say my experience of American white Christianity, which is like very specific, it was all about love. And yet the hatred wasn't obviously towards anybody. It mm -hmm. was but it was heavily directed towards the self. Of yeah. Like you, you, you can't possibly do anything good. Mm -hmm. And so you need this powerful force outside of you to be something bigger and greater than you are. So you yeah. can't be a 13 year old. You have to be a 13 year old covered by this cosmic perfection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that then you're okay, but only then. Mm -hmm. And so it, your humanity has to shrink down to the size of a whatever. And so you need the structures, you need the thing, you need the words, you need the songs, you need the, you need the pancake breakfasts to, to, yeah. to know that you're still in the club. What is so much at stake for young people is, are they in the club of just being a human being? Like, are, are they okay with being on this earth? And I think that like, that's something that immediately stuck out to, mm -hmm me listening to your album, I think so much of what you're saying is so interesting of like it being stripped down. It feels like it's a hyper-focused message to, to the natural process of being young and mm -hmm. growing into whatever it is. Um, yeah. I've been thinking about ju just what you were talking about. I've been thinking about sort of that notion a lot recently. I think just in doing a lot of interviews to promote Preacher's Kid, I was thinking about like, you know, one of the first songs you probably learn is like, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me. So it's like one of the first things you learn as a mm -hmm. kid. Like I know for me, probably like one of the first five songs. And then I've been trying to place like, when was I told otherwise? Cause you're nine, you're 10. And it's still very much like, here are the parables. And like, God loves you so much. And Jesus mm -hmm. died for you. And it's that messaging of love and love and love and just abundant love. And I, I think I wish I could pinpoint the first time, maybe 12 or 13, that that was contradicted by a church leader, where then you're introduced to the idea of Jesus loves you, but here's some things he's not going to like. <laughs> like. You know what I mean? And, I, and I've just been kind of wondering when that starts you know if it you know think about like sunday school and like the little kids in sunday school and i i can only speak from from my own experience and from that of other people in my life perhaps someone has something entirely different but like the concept of of hell is not hammered in when you're a little kid like those messages in sunday school early on are of love you know mm -hmm. and of like pursuing god and how God just loves you so much. And Jesus just loves you so much. You almost create this imaginary character, like this imaginary friend of Jesus is how it's sort of introduced. And like, he's always there for you and always loves you. And then it's, and then the message starts to change. And it's mm -hmm. like, why? And, and the reasons why it changes are, you know, because of modesty and because of um, just normal teenage things like we've been talking about, they equate those with some mm -hmm. sort of deviance. Mm -hmm. And 
I think that's so incredibly harmful because it is Christians who introduce shame. They're like inviting that shame into the heart of a kid. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's just something I've been thinking about. Like when, when was the first time that someone went from Jesus loves you to mm -hmm. Jesus might not, I mean, he'll love you, but he's really not going to like you <laughs> if you yeah. do these things. It's so interesting because I mean, everything you're saying, it seems like, well, it really does match how a human body mm -hmm. develops mm -hmm. this coming online of growing into your sexuality, growing into your, you know, just being a sexual human being, not necessarily anything specific there, but of just like, oh, suddenly there are things happening that you do not have control over. Mm -hmm. You can control whether or not a kid touches the stove or not. You know, like you can, yeah. to a certain degree, like you can say like, don't do that. And kids mm -hmm. at a certain age are compliant. But then you start to realize both for yourself and for those outside of that who are in many, uh, many experiences of mine, the lack of control of seeing you go through that reminds them that they don't have control over their own body, what yeah. it desires, what it does, what it smells like, what, what's growing on it, like what it's attracted to. Like, mm -hmm. and so it feels like this totally, it almost seems like it's synonymous with like, well, here's the, here's the evil we've been talking about. And yet there are also strategies in place that do give the illusion that you are in control because if you tamper things down, then you can stop doing something or you, but like, like you're saying, like what you said earlier of like this mm -hmm. divine kind of comes out, you like put it into a small box. It leaks out somewhere else. Yeah. You're, I mean, it's it, like, they're, they're trying to put a lid on something that cannot be contained, you yeah. know, like it will <laughs> reminds me of like the Jurassic park quote, like life will find a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that was totally true for me because I, really early on, I knew who I was. I mean, even so far as like gender presentation, like I was always a tomboy. I like tell the story of like, I would slick my hair back after a shower and it would like tuck, tuck it behind my neck. So it would look like I had short hair and I would be like, wow, like imagine like a world where I could just have hair like this because I didn't know that you can just have hair like that. Like you can just have, you can cut your hair however you want. And, um, I think that when I started just acknowledging who I've always known myself to be just when I almost like started like, all right, let me start dressing in the way that I've always wanted to and experimenting with my hair and gender presentation and all this stuff. Only then was I interested in a more intimate divine connection because I was acknowledging the divine within me. And we say mm -hmm. that we're all image bearers, right? You know, everyone's an image bearer. Everyone is a child of God. And then we, I mean, like the collective, we a church with a capital C do everything to strip them of the difference that I believe is just inherently divine. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, no, 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 you have to adhere to these. That's why like on TikTok, there's, um, this trend that uh, my wife started about like show yourself before and after religious deconstruction and people will share photos and everyone's kind of looking the same in the group photos. It's like very homogenized. And it's because these church communities just strip you of everything that made you that, that God placed on your heart to be and to become mm -hmm. and to explore. And I think that that's a, a very unique brand of Christian cruelty. Mm hmm. Christian cruelty. Wow. Yeah, that level of 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 trying to contain by um, diluting, mm -hmm. by making uniform. And I don't exactly know where that place is because, like, there is place for kind of common ag agreements on certain things that can feel really connective and and very right. like life giving in any community, not necessarily just the religious community. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know exactly what those are, other than as I just live my life, I'm like, oh, like a lot of people respond well to being kind. Like, <laughs> like it's so non-prescriptive, but it's just like, works. oh, everybody likes that. So like then the things that need to be nailed down feel like they become fewer and fewer as I, and like they will continue that way in my lifetime of like, all right, like what do I, what are the minimum things that I need in order to like remain connected to somebody? I don't know. In my opinion, Christian, white Christian evangelicalism in Illinois, central Illinois, was very focused on 
you not understanding, you suddenly grow into somebody that can make those decisions, that you grow into some, mm-hmm. somebody that gets to choose. So stifling choice, stifling this, like, like you're saying, individuality of like, yeah, what do I like? What do I not like? Those are specific to me. And it's really not the church's business. I think what's interesting about you staying connected to, well, I'll just add, like, do you Mm -hmm. see yourself as like a Christian person? Like, do you see yourself as connected to a Christian faith? Is that kind of how you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally do. I think that I always like to clarify that I am a faithfully skeptical Christian. So like, Mm -hmm. I'm a very safe place for uh, conversations about doubt and questioning and um, like, was I programmed to believe this? Like how much of this is bullshit? Like we welcome that in my house. Mm -hmm. Like that's all good and well. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly someone who has a lot of questions and a lot of hurt that I think is unaddressed by the church. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, when I am tucking myself into bed, there I am praying to God, thankful for Mm -hmm. the things that I have in my life that I'm so blessed to have. Mm -hmm. And that is as true as my doubt, you Mm -hmm. know, and like my, my, my uh, discernment looking into scripture and translations and interpretations, which I I did more heavily when I was more openly coming out and wrestling with faith, but that's Mm -hmm. just as true as, um, you know, as the, as the prayers that I find great comfort in every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I try and hold space for both of it. And I, Mm -hmm wish that we talked about that more, or I wish that like conservative Christian culture talked about that more, but Mm -hmm. I think it's inconvenient. And I think it's maybe a more difficult conversation, you know? So instead it's baked in that if you're not a true believer, then GTFO, (laughs) like if you Mm -hmm. are, and, and I don't, I honestly, I don't know that many people who can honestly say that they are true believers. Like some of the most faithful, devoted Christians I know openly have wrestled with doubt and anger. And I don't, and, and like, if, if that's true, then why, you know, taking Christian radio as an example, why is that never expressed? Why are we mm-hmm. pretending? Why, why are we all pretending like we're all doing great because we know mm-hmm. that this human experience is going to be hard for all of us and we will not be spared from sorrow. So why don't Mm -hmm. we talk about it? And why Mm -hmm. don't we talk about the complicit, like how the church is complicit in some of this pain and a Mm -hmm. lot of this pain? Obviously this whole album and this conversation for you, it sounds like your faith doesn't exempt you from the human experience. In Mm -hmm. fact, it's just, it's another aspect of your human experience, which I think is very contrasted by at least the, the loud voices in maybe more mainstream evangelical of just like, no, we, we can't let you have this, this title unless we confirm a few things first. Like we need to go through yeah. like a checklist kind of going back to what you're saying of that confidence on stage of like Tegan and Sarah of like holding all these things with a level of confidence is mm-hmm. enviable to somebody who is in a, a, a restrictive environment. It's like, wow, yeah. like how do you, hold that without being crushed. Like, cause that's the message that's presented. It's like, well, these things will, these two, let's just say binary mm-hmm. things will like rip you apart if you're not totally. on one side or the other. And if you are modeling something where it's like, hmm, I'm yeah. still here and I'm happy. Can you believe that? Yeah, no, no, it's you're totally like- it. <laughs> I think that like that, you no, that you're totally hitting on something because I think that I heard that you, if I were to be myself, that I would never find fulfillment. If I were to be true to who I am, that I would feel alone, and that I would not be able to have a personal relationship with God, that that's just off limits. And I'm the proof that that was wrong. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that like I lead a perfect life, far from it far, Mm -hmm. far from it, but I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. I have friends. I have family. I have a wife that I love who loves me. We got married in the church. You know, I'm fine. And I think that like, I remember like lying in my bed in high school, like probably like blasting switch foot or something and just being like, will I ever feel fine? 
Like, will I mm. ever be fine? How? I don't understand this. I don't understand how I'm ever going to be fine. And that felt like impossible. Just mm. like, and, and that like, just so like, it's a profound loneliness when you kind of convince yourself. And I think they were able to do a better job of this before social media um, became so prevalent because I, you, I couldn't find I, I couldn't find people. I, I knew like Ellen and Portia, end of list. Like that's it. I couldn't find like happy queer people. And mm -hmm. so the things that I was finding, especially if you look up like gay Christian, were all like ex-gay testimonies that were fucking terrifying and mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being like, will I ever feel fine? And, and I think that that's part of why I, I'm very humbled and grateful for the visibility that I've been able to receive with this project because I, I hope that if there's, if there's, you know, a me out there that we were all doing this for to help our younger selves that like they would see I'm fine, that there's mm -hmm. someone out there that is not perfect, but I'm fine and you mm -hmm. will be fine, you know, mm -hmm. and that you will find people who love you and mm -hmm. that that love is waiting for you. Mm -hmm. That seems so simple and corny almost, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't, I just, I literally, I was like, is it only Ellen and Portia? <laughs> like, is that it? Do I have to know Ellen and Portia in <laughs> yeah, order to be like, fine? Yeah, exactly. Are Ellen and Portia the only ones? And they're so, like, they're so mega, like, celebrities at the time, too. <laughs> I remember being like, I don't even relate to this. Like, I don't want a helicopter chasing me down on my wedding day. I just want to have a wife. Yeah. It's 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 funny. Like, I I'm not steeped in Christian music anymore. But anyway, when I heard your album, it's about listening to your story and your feeling of your own story. And the truthfulness just felt so fresh, so new. So, yeah, I think for me, like reconnective to like a younger version of myself is like, oh, like I wish somebody this confident that things uh, will, will, will unfold. Mm -hmm. That person wasn't there. You know, that person wasn't there to to be confident when I wasn't confident, like you're saying, like, yeah, will I ever be fine? Like, how great would it have been to somebody be like, you're going to be fine. No, no, no. And it'll to be hard. Empathize. It will be hard, but you'll be fine. Like, I mean, that not, and not to downplay huge. it, but mm -hmm. to have gone before and been like, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. And to be fully empathetic. But at mm -hmm. the same time, like, I got you. And I think it's very beautiful to see somebody like you who's still holding on to all the things that you want to hold on to. And one of those yeah. is like your faith and say like, guess what? Like, I'm not throwing out the things that I love. Like mm -hmm. I get to hold, I get to carry all these things because it's mine to choose, you know? Yeah. I think it really means a lot to know that this project resonated with so many people from different walks of life because I was so nervous that like, mm -hmm. like, what if I was alone? Like, I just, I don't know. I, I like, my, I got my expectations pretty low and, you know, sometimes that's like a, a self-preservatory, -preser mm -hmm. like, I don't know if that's a word, tool. It just means a lot to know that like people have listened to this and in their own way said like, I understand you. And like, I'm, I'm here too, that there's more of us has been so heartbreaking and encouraging. Mm -hmm. yeah i wish you all the best in this these next thank you your whole life what the heck <laughs> i wish you the best for the next, next two months the next two, two months. months after that i'm really <laughs> hoping you fail you get two months of success and then you're out of there and then it's someone else thank you so much for being willing to 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 chat i'm very yeah, happy to meet you and thank you so much for having me it was nice to meet you and i'll um absolutely. we'll be in touch when this comes out and so absolutely take care bye <laughs>